Join us as we sit down with remarkable individuals from various walks of life who faced their fair share of obstacles and emerged with positivity. Each episode, you'll hear inspiring stories, actionable tips, and wisdom that can supercharge your own journey when using adversity as motivation. Let's learn together. Welcome to Lauer Power. Welcome to another episode of Lauer Power. Alongside Chad Lauer, I am Chad Evans. This podcast is using adversity as motivation. That's what we like to talk about, Chad. Yes, sir. And I'm super happy to be back at it again with you today. And adversity comes in all different shapes and sizes. And today we have somebody that's going to talk about adversity through their work. The topic of the day is going to be leading in crisis and we're super excited to bring it to you. And listen, before we get started, I I just want to tell a a short story on Evan Gajkowski because we're just going to get right into it in this podcast. Sometimes you have those people in your life who are just like always there. The unique part about today's podcast is Evan and I have been friends for as long as I can remember. And when you have those childhood friends, you can leave the area for 16 years and you come back and it's like you didn't miss a beat, right? Pick up right where you left off. Yeah. I mean, you, you're getting together with those friends for the Super Bowl, right? You're darn right. I am. Yeah. You could not see each other forever. And it's like, Hey man, like we didn't miss a beat. So Evan's that person to me. So this podcast is a little bit tougher for me. Um, and it's a little bit emotional for me because of the personal connection, but I want to tell a story about Evan. So I I talked about my brain tumor, uh, at 21 years old in a previous podcast. And Evan was, I believe either just starting his career or he was still in nursing school, but I'll never forget the comfort that I felt going into the hospital knowing that he was in there. It sounds really bizarre. You know, you talk about family and friends. And when I, I was wheeled out of that surgery, I don't know how the heck he even got there, but when I woke up and they were wheeling me to my room, he was walking alongside of the bed, literally just holding on to the bed with Aaron Bell, who was another classmate of ours and another nurse. And they just said, you're okay. We got you. And he always seems to be there. So Recently, it's another health issue we were dealing with as a family. I don't really want to talk about it, but I'm walking into the hospital. This was literally like maybe within the last year. And my wife and I are kind of stressed and we're walking into Geisinger. And right as we come from the parking garage, there he is just walking in, literally just walking into the hospital. So we meet at the entrance and he's like, what's going on here? And he's just there. And I think he's that for so many people. And I think you'll learn that in this podcast. I can't wait to hear for you to hear his story, but it it makes me realize that uh, we need to continue to support the heck out of each other. And I think sometimes we're like, oh, these nurses have it so good or these doctors have it so good. And, you know, because they earn a certain amount of money or they have a certain lifestyle, but they deal with some really, really, really tough stuff. And, um, you know, I think you'll get into that a little bit in today's podcast. Our guest today is Evan Gajkowski. Um, Evan is a nurse practitioner at Geisinger Health System. Um, He's the ECMO coordinator, which we're going to learn about today, which is just fascinating science. Um, Evan has uh, presented at over 11 medical conferences. Um, He's published in over six medical journals. And he's just a true inspiration uh, with the way he's facing literally death in every day of his life. And, And he was just awesome to join us on this podcast. And I can't wait to share his story with you today. So um, just to get started, Evan, as long as I can remember you, you always wanted to be a nurse. You were the kid in high school who was like, you know what, I just want to go to nursing school, right? You knew from a really, really young age that that you wanted that. What is it inside of you that made you want to be a nurse and and made you so passionate about helping others? I think that um, it's kind of a family-based thing. My cousin is a nurse. And I think we had to do like a project our junior year, right. Of like what we wanted to pursue as our, as our career. And I didn't know he was over the house one day at my parents' house and he was like, you should do nursing. I was like, you're right. I should. And I was like, okay. And he was a pretty good mentor to me um, to get started in nursing and to kind of pursue it. And I think I kind of got pushed into it because my family, I have an uncle that's a doctor and his children are doctors and then my side of the family my mom actually was i i found out um 
over the years, she was a medical assistant for some time, but she never told me. And I don't know why. I just remember her always cleaning houses, right? And one day she was like, oh, I used to be a medical assistant. So it's kind of in the bloodstream. My brother is an, as a nurse. And I think that um, it's just how I was brought up. My parents would always say, and my grandparents would always say, that you need to treat others as you want to be treated. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit too, of, of how I got here. But I think to answer the question, I just enjoy, I enjoy helping other individuals. I enjoy being a kind of somebody there that you can be like, oh, Evan's right there. Evan's here. He's on it. He's going to take care of it for you. My grandmother was sick when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do um, after high school. And I came into the hospital and I saw how some of the doctors and nurses were treating her. And then I saw my cousin and he had like his blue scrubs on. And I was like, oh man, that's really cool. That's awesome. He likes to, he was running around and everybody, you know, he was like kind of uh, enjoyed it and talked me into it. And then he was like, hey, you can make really good money. And I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. And tell us a little bit about what is ECMO. Sure. So I got into ECMO, went to nursing school, went into pediatric intensive care. I don't know what it was. I just enjoyed pediatrics and taking care of kids. And I'm I'm still, I act, I'm four years old, but I act 12. Just ask my wife. Um, <laughs> and I just felt that normal taking care of kids. Cause that was like, you know, uh, uh, Chad's wife, actually, I worked with her for some time in the pediatric intensive care unit. And I enjoyed that. Uh, I, it was very, very stressful at times, but for every kid that, uh, didn't make it. There was like two really good cases that did make it. So when I started there, there was like, a, I think I was there for a couple of weeks and there was a case of a kid that had heart surgery and came back on ECMO. ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, essentially life support outside of the body is, is what a, a basic is. There's two different forms. There's cardiac and there's pulmonary. Cardiac is when a pediatric patient comes off of uh, having a cardiac surgery and they're on cardiopulmonary bypass for such a long period of time that their heart is not moving and then they have cardioplegia and they're basically, the surgeon is suturing things, but they're on cardiopulmonary bypass for so long. And when they go to restart the heart, sometimes it takes a little bit and the heart is sluggish and the patient is in shock. And the only way to kind of fix that is you can put them on ECMO sometimes to bridge them to the area where their heart can recover and fully function of why they had the surgery in the first place. That's the original concept of where it has come from. The pulmonary part really came to the forefront of a medical support system or a life support system during H1N1 flu back in 2008. Now it was used before that for pneumonias and influenzas and and those type of things. But it really jump-started in 2008. There was a study that came out and showed maybe there's a little bit of a benefit to ECMO versus just regular intubation, a breathing tube on a ventilator. So two forms of ECMO, cardiac, pulmonary pulmonary just for lungs, heart still works, cardiac, lungs, and heart doesn't work. You put large tubes inside of the chest or in the groin or the neck, pull off venous blood, send it through a pump, send it through an oxygenator, back to the body. So essentially your blood is pumped outside of your body, right? That's essentially what's happening. Exactly. Okay. And so Sometimes though, it, sometimes it's hard for people to like picture it, and then they Google it, and then it, you know it just shows all these all crazy pictures. But a good way to say it is almost dialysis for the lungs or dialysis for the heart. So like a machine that looks like that that pumps the blood, but just larger tubes and cannulas that go into the body. Okay. And how did you become the ECMO coordinator? So you you went from you know, your previous experience, which you just mentioned, how did you decide, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and make that next step in your career. Yeah. I, I had really good mentors that brought me up through like my cousin. And then I had some nurse practitioners that kind of were like, you should try to do this or you should think about doing this. And I was like, again, I was kind of like, okay. Um, and I was really, really interested when I was working in the pediatric intensive care unit and I saw this ECMO machine. And I was like, what is this? 
what what I I want to do I want to take care of this person they're the sickest person I want I want in on this and as soon, whenever there was education or like some type of certification to get ECMO training I was like I'm gonna go do that I'm doing it if there was like a book I was like I'm I'm getting that book what book do you have there that's on ECMO I'm getting that and so I was high like this like this obsession with ECMO. And as soon as they were like, we're starting a program here, because before that, we would send all of our patients out. They would go to Philadelphia or they would go to Hershey. They would even go out to Pittsburgh. And so I was like, this is great. We're going to have an ECMO program here. And so I applied for the job. I didn't get it, actually. There was a, a coworker of mine that got it. She was in the position for a couple months and calls me and she says, it's yours. I can't do it. I can't do it. And I was like, okay, all right. And then... They called me and they were like, do you want the job? She said she wants to step aside. And I said, sure, I, I, let's do it. Let's go. And no fault to her. Um, she was really great. She started the base work of everything. And um, I kind of came in and I was like, we're doing this, this, and this. And this is how I see this working. And so that's how I kind of got, I kind of got into it by association, right? So somebody was given to somebody and then they were like, uh, I can't do it. You, you try Wow, dude, that's great. And and again, the power of mentors and sticking with it is is a key to what we're doing here. So listen, nobody likes to talk about it anymore, but I'm going to bring it up. COVID. Part of the reason why I want to have you on this podcast is we talk on this podcast about putting ourselves in other people's shoes, okay? And what I want you to tell us is what was a day in the life of Evan Gaikowski as the ECMO coordinator during COVID. And before you answer, I watched, I personally watched the five days in May documentary that Geisinger shared. So if people are interested in watching that, I highly encourage it, but tell me what a day in the life of Evan Gaikowski as the ECMO coordinator was like during COVID. Such a loaded question. And like so many emotions go through me as you, as you asked that. And I think you asked me that before. In the middle of the night, it usually starts because I can't sleep. So I would wake up around 2.30, 3 o'clock, and I would check the patients on my phone. So we have Epic on our phone, and I would go through and kind of check the patients and see how they were doing. I could check their labs. I knew that their lab draws were around 3.30 or so, so I could look at 4 o'clock, maybe see their labs. Fall back asleep then. Wake up 6 o'clock in the morning in a different bedroom than my wife and my kids, and my dogs, and my cats, get a shower in the guest bedroom, get dressed in clothes that I could wear to the hospital, but also I would take an extra pair in case I needed to literally throw those ones away. So I'd wear regular clothes to the hospital, drive to, the, drive to work, get to the hospital, probably 7, 7.30 now, and we start our day, we start our rounds. So we go into the hospital, we would have to go into a specific locker room. Now at this time, there's everything shut down, right? You're driving to work by yourself. There's no traffic. You come to the hospital, you can park wherever you want because there's no one here, right? There's no families here. It's, it's deserted, very awkward. Um, you come into the hospital, you have, to wear, you have to wear your mask. You have to report with your badge. Why are you here? What are you doing, right? Just kind of like right as soon as you walk through the door, you're kind of hitting the face, like, what are you doing here? What, what? I was like, oh, I work here, right? Here's my bed. And that was their job to make sure people weren't coming in that weren't supposed to. Go to the locker room, get changed into a special set of scrubs, put on a hat, put on booties, put my N95 back on. Then we would go into a cold section. So we'd go into the ICU, go through a door, and we were in a cold section. That section, you could take your mask off, you could eat or drink something in that cold section. Then we go through a warm section. Go through a warm section, you put your gown on, put your paper mask if you had to, put, make sure your goggles, your eyes were covered, put, and make sure there was something covering your head. And then somebody was video, watching a video of you doing this, doing all this stuff. You'd wave to them, you'd show them your badge, who you were, what you were doing, you'd tell them. It was really hard yet if you had a paper mask on. So it was like these big hoods that had air come up and they would inflate so you could breathe in them. 
in the, if you couldn't wear a PAPR, you can only wear a N95 mask if you shaved that day because it doesn't make a good seal here. So if you shave that day, you could wear an N95. If you didn't, you had to wear a PAPR. Then you'd go into the hot zones. You're in the cold, warm, hot. So you're in the hot zone. You're in the hot zone. You could stay in the hot zone for sometimes up to 10 hours. Now that you can't drink anything, you can't eat anything. You have access to computers and stuff. You have, you're seeing other individuals and that's where the patients are. You're right outside the patient's rooms and you could go into their room at any time and then access other rooms. We would start our rounds around 730, which means there's a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a registered nurse, residents, fellows, all. We start at one patient. We start at room one and then we go and go to each room. Now at this time, Usually when you're in the intensive care unit, everybody's di- there. There's a different patient. That guy's got a stroke and he's here for, for this. Okay, let's talk about him. All right, this one over here, they fell out of a tree stand while they were hunting. Okay, yeah, well, he's a trauma patient. This one over here, she has pneumonia and she got really sick. She's on the ventilator and she <clears throat> she's sick here. There's none of that. There was none of that. Everybody was COVID. Everybody. Every single one of them. I've never, and it was just very odd for me because everybody was a COVID patient, right? Do our rounds, give some nurses a break. Some people would have like panic attacks wearing the masks or wearing the hoodies. It would give them claustrophobia and you're locked in. There's not much window space to see, right? The only thing you can see is like the clock. People had brought um, like different speakers in that you could, um, like play music through just so we could have some type of uh, auditory thing, except for like the wind blowing in, in, on our head. There were these negative pressure vents. They would like wheel them in and they were hooked up to the duct system through the ceiling that they would vent. So there's like all this crazy noise wearing all this stuff. And the only way you can get a break is if somebody comes in and gives you a break, right? You can go back out to the cold zone for a little bit. So do our rounds have our lunch if we can get checked out. Each time you would go in and out, you would have to wear a different gown. You'd have to wipe off with different uh, disinfectant wipes. Wipe your And if you missed or contaminated yourself, which I'm uh, I'm a slob, so like I, I, I have no idea, I would literally like take my stuff off and they'd be like, you contaminated your gown or your scrubs. So you need to go decom and go out. I was like, okay, so you'd have to go out go down to the locker room, take all your stuff off, shower, get changed, and you can come back up. So it was like this whole big process. And if you, then they would like, if you decon, if you had like, you contaminate yourself, you, they would literally like follow up with you and see if you had symptoms. Do you have symptoms or you coughed? You, you know, scan our, you know, we, had, we were getting our temperatures everywhere we were going. They had those like, like uh, temperature, temporal temperature scanners. So I'd do that to probably four or five o'clock. Now, during the day, rounds, you're taking care of the patients, you're giving them their medications, you're taking them the procedures, or most of the time, we actually brought the OR to them because we didn't want to contaminate anybody in the hallway. So you actually bring the OR to them. So if they need a tracheostomy or G-tube or some form of intervention, you literally bring everything to them. So a lot going through the day. The ICU was 18 beds, plus we opened up another one across the hall that was another eight beds, and then one downstairs, which was 17 beds. So two floors um, of that that we would go through, and we would check all of our ECMO patients um, probably by 5, 5.30 and try to get out of there. And... Um, change back into my regular street clothes or the stuff I wore to the hospital. I'd shower, obviously, I'd shower. I'd go downstairs, back to the locker room, shower, get my stuff on, and walk out. Still walking out with an N95 mask on, back to my car. Um, and there's this there's this hill back behind Geisinger. There's these trails. And I'd park my car there. And a lot of the days I just kept walking past my truck and I'd go up and run the run to the top of the mountain back behind the, the trails here. Um, kind of release some stress. Get back in the car, drive home six o'clock, try to decompress from the day. 
before I went into the house, my wife would have me, I, not that she wanted me to, but I would fully undress right there in the garage. I would go past her in my underwear, my children, right? I would go back up, I'd go upstairs and I, the stuff I wore to work that day to make sure I didn't contaminate them, I put it into a bag and then do laundry with like later on or keep like a little laundry basket in the garage. And I go upstairs, shower, isolate myself from them, um, go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again. And I have to ask you in that moment, and be honest with me, how, how scared were you? Real scared. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't see my parents. Right. If I did see them, I went to their house. And I saw them from outside from a distance. I didn't want to get anybody sick. My wife didn't go see her parents up in they're up above Scranton. They live in Honesdale. Didn't go see them. My kids didn't play with any other kids because I was a frontline worker and I was working with patients that had COVID. So God forbid if I got them sick, then they would get someone else sick. Like so I had this huge like guilt and I was like, if I get this fear and guilt, like, oh my gosh, I can't get anybody. I, I got to make sure I can't get anybody sick. Um, it was scary. If we had one of the nurses got sick um, and we were like, like one of my employees, she got sick and we had this, they had to decontaminate her and swab her every couple of days. And he, luckily she just had like this asthma, um, sinus infection from God knows what, but I mean, it, it, when she, if she did get sick, we were like, I, like we were really scared, but I had to call somebody and I was like, I think so-and-so might have COVID. What? And like, yeah, I know we had coworkers, doctors, nurses, physical therapists. We had people that we worked with that we took care of in the hospital, like that, they were there for weeks. You'd work with them and then they were, they were there in the bed. And you, and you kept showing up. You kept coming in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, what else was I going to do? I, I, you know, I, I had a job. I had a, people were looking up to me. My staff was looking up to me. So by, I wanted to work as hard as they were working. I knew that they were doing four, 12 hour, four or five, 12 hour shifts a, a week. Right. I got to do as much as them or I got to do more. Right. I got to make sure that they're okay. I got to make sure that they get a break because I, I, I am responsible for them. I have to lead them. I have to motivate them to come here every day. They've been doing this. You know, we were doing it from March of 2020 to like August of 21 before things kind of like the needle turned a little bit. Right. So, and, but no, uh, listen, I'm a, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty emotional guy. Like we're similar in a way that like we kind of wear our emotions on our sleeves. Right. So yeah. how do you literally go in to this environment every single day and then come out of it and people tell you that it's not really happening? Like, I, I, I'm sorry, like, I, I know we're a divided country and, and, and I want to put politics aside for a minute, but like, you literally are in this hospital doing all of these things, sacrificing your family, sacrificing your times just to try to care for somebody else's family member. And people are telling you that it's not really happening. Like, how did you deal with that? My wife bought a Peloton and I put 2,700 miles on it. And, and, and you're not, jo and you're not joking, right? I know that's that, like, that's not you saying I put 2,700 miles on it as a joke. That's you literally burn off steam. So you probably didn't yeah. lose your mind. Right. Yeah. And, and we're able to keep yourself in check and, and that's how you dealt with the exercise. Is that right? Every day I, I, I ran or biked every day, every day. That was a way for me to escape. I could use exercise. I could, I, you know, I athlete in high school, I would kind of do this. I would literally catch my breath. If someone would confront me, I don't have social media anymore because of the, because of these situations, yep. I was getting threats. My wife was getting messages on her social media and i was getting threats on my social media from people i didn't even know because i would talk i would speak out and say like go get vaccinated i got my kids vaccinated i got myself i was like w when the vaccines came out i i got into a lottery here a guy saying i was the ninth one to sign up the ninth i just could not comprehend that 
people would think this. Like, it, it was just unfathomable. I, I don't know how else to really describe it. It was just so confusing to me that I would do, I was doing this every day, but there was this whole other world of stuff going on. And I was so focused on like, all right, we're taking care of these guys. This, this medication's working. This, this is doing good. All right. This vaccine is showing benefit. This one's not, this medication we're using is really good. All right. What, what are we, when are we going to be able to get this medication here for our patients? I was so focused on that. I had no idea all this other stuff was going on. Like I had such a focus on making sure I was doing the best and taking care of these people and then making sure that my staff had the best information that I didn't even realize all this stuff was going on back here until the school board meeting. And I was floored. I walk in and everyone's arguing about going back to school with masks. <laughs> it's not funny, man. Like you were putting people in body bags, right? There's, there was a tractor trailer that was cooled sitting over by the Henry Hood Center that was overflow for the morgue. I would drive by it. When I go home, I go, I go out that way. I, I go past the Henry Hood Center. There's a tractor trailer that's hooked up to the hospital so the air conditioning can keep the bodies inside cold before they can go to the funeral home until there's enough room at the funeral home for them to go there. And then I, have, I go to a school board meeting and there's people telling me that masks don't work. And I'm just like, what is, what is going on? I get, I'm getting like this. I get excited. I'm getting like, like this. Yeah. And I, I, I was like dumbfounded. I, I literally looked around the room and I was like, I stood up, I raised my hand. And I was like, I can't even believe this is ha This is happening. Are you, are you being a hundred percent serious? And people were like, you don't know what you're talking about. And you know, th th that's not you. you. What do you know? And I was like, what do I know? I, I'm in it every day. Are you kidding me? I would have to kind of do this. I'd have to like, all right, let me, let me slow down. Let me take a deep breath. Let me think about it. Let me put, let me put myself in their shoes. They're not doing this every day. They're scared. They don't understand it maybe that much. How can I help them understand? And then, so I would, I would kind of like do that. Right. And I, you're right. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'll, I'll cry at a good movie. And, you know, if we get into a deep conversation, uh, I'll be ready to break. But I could only, there was only so much that I could take, right? My wife getting messages on her social media account. I had to get rid of all my social media accounts because people were messaging me and tell me, you know, the, these things like, you don't know what you're talking about. And you, you're going to, you know, I hope your kids get sick from the vaccine, like just awful stuff. And I'm thinking, what kind of world are we living in, right? Yeah, man. And, and this podcast is about like, you know, using adversity as motivation. Right. And it's interesting, you know, my wife stays at home with the kids, but she's a physician, right? My whole family has been employed by Geisinger. My mom was a nurse who went into Epic, you know, my mother-in-law is a nurse. I mean, that's just where we live in central PA. It's like the biggest employer. And really this was the closest thing to a war zone that we've ever seen a, a tractor trailer full of overflow bodies, you know, and we tend to, I think, become numb to that. Imagine a world where we supported the heck out of each other in that situation. And that's going to make me transition to, I have to, I have to ask this. There's so many positives that come from what you do. You save so many people's lives. You guys do such great work, but how do you go from losing somebody, a patient at work to going home, turning it off and being there as a normal person for your wife and your kids. Like how, how do you do that every day? Yeah. It's hard, really hard. Everybody kind of does their own different things. I can, in the beginning, I was just so focused on work that I was working at home and I'd open my laptop and, you know, continue to work at home and make connections with other um, hospital and institutions. And um, as the ECMO coordinator, I connected with, actually, I actually assisted in helping other Pennsylvania hospitals, New Jersey and Maryland. We would actually get on a call every week. And then it was every two weeks that we would discuss the best way to take care of these patients. And I was a part of like leadership for that. 
I was, so I was doing other things while I was going home, maybe about, so every day I would do that routine that we kind of discussed and, you know, go home and try to click it off exercise. I just keep going to walk right past my car and go up the hill, right? Run up the hill and run back down. During the pandemic, nobody was allowed in the hospital. So usually if someone dies in the hospital, their family's there, right? It was just us. There was no, no families. Nobody came into the hospital to see their family member die. I think it, it, right in the beginning, maybe a couple months in, five or six months in, we got these like iPads, right? From leadership and it was so like family members could FaceTime with her, you know, just to make a connection. Well, basically the only way we were using them in the ICU was it was for families to say goodbye. Goodbye meaning we would have discussions with them and say, they're not going to live. We can't do anything else for them. They're going to die. They're on life support. As soon as we turn off life support, they will die. I can remember there was a patient that I was helping take care of that we were going to uh, dis, you know, we were going to take them off life support. And we, we had a plan like 11 o'clock, we were going to have the meeting. And I had like the iPad next to the guy's head and the wife was there and she was, you know, and then like the kids got on and the kids are saying goodbye, right? To their dad, dad, love you, daddy, you know, hey, um, you know, and the wife just like hysterical. And I'm the one that was telling the wife, like, you know, may help him make the medical decisions. Like he's not going to live, he's going to die. We can't do anything else for him. And that one, when the kids came on and they're like, bye, dad, love you. Right. I'll see you. I'll see you later. Love you, daddy. And then I like hit a button on the ventilator and hit a button on the ECMO machine. and That's it. And then I'm supposed to get in my car and drive home. Like, Hey, everything's great. Life's awesome. And I would kind of have this routine. I would do the exercise after work and get in my truck. Drive, start driving home at Boyd Station, right when I make the left to go home, like on the back way to Catawas. I would kind of like put the windows down and I would either have it real quiet or I would just crank music and like get it and just kind of like let it all kind of get out, get out of the car, get out of the truck. And then by the time I got back to close to my house within a mile, I'd put the windows back up and I'd calm myself back down and I'd leave it all, I'd leave it all there. Right. I'd leave it all there before I came to the house. I left it all on the way home. I, I don't think any of us can relate, but I'll tell you one thing, man, I'm super proud of you because we need you. We need people like this to take care of our communities. And I, I don't think we can ever support what you're doing and what doctors and nurses and staff in the hospital do every single day. People who've listened to our previous podcast know how many times <laughs> somebody saved my life. So my passion comes out in this podcast because I've been that patient who didn't want anybody to leave my room. One of my biggest fears in COVID, right? I'll tell you right now, one of my biggest fears in COVID, I've been in that hospital and I wouldn't let my wife leave the room. And I could not imagine, I told her this a million times, I could not imagine being in there and not having somebody with me. That, that's the tough stuff. You've kind of talked about the tough stuff. Let's talk about the wins. I have to imagine what keeps you going is, when you have that patient who needs ECMO, and remember, if you need ECMO, you're not in a good situation, right? You're, you're, this is like a last ditch effort, if I'm understanding it correctly, in many situations. But tell us about some of your wins, man. Tell us about, you know, the person who you saved their life and you watched them walk out. And I think I, I watched the five days in May. You guys have that line of celebration where everybody's clapping. Tell us about a few of those situations. The best. It's like you, you won the Super Bowl, right? Or I, you know, I equate it to. Chad is like, remember how we all felt when you scored your thousandth point? Remember how you felt? Toilet paper everywhere. <laughs> yeah, right? So there's like a, there's a little video, there's a video, I have it on my computer, and there's a video of like Lauer's thousandth point. And I remember you chicken the ball down the court and you like laid up and it hit the front of the rim and bounced off and you got your own rebound and then laid it up like on the other side. Yep. And then just explosion in the chaos, right? <laughs> That's what it's like. Yeah. That's what it. That's that's what I can equate it to. That's what it's like for all of us. If we can get a patient to get out of here after having such a high form of life support, and I I I'd never known how close to get with patients, right? I I'd never I've I've asked the question to many people before, and there's people on one side that'll be like, "You don't give them your cell phone number. Don't tell them where you live." Right. Right. Yeah. You don't make any contact with them outside of these walls. Uh -huh. Why would you do that? And then, I, and then on the other hand, I'm like, well, why? What's the point? Why not? 
why can't I? What, uh, why? Why not? If they want to talk to me, why can't I talk to them? Yeah. And so the people that to be like that were like continuously thanking me, or if I needed something for work, like, hey, I'm trying to promote my program or, or my ECMO program. Do you want to come and do some marketing or something? Like, absolutely. Let's do it. Right. Here's my cell phone number. Let's do that. The best thing ever. Like I, I do this every day because around Thanksgiving or Christmas time or New Year's or the anniversary of when the patients went home, I always get a text message from somebody. Mm. Always. Oh man. I get a text message from, from somebody that says, thanks for saving my life. Oh. And I, and just that little phrase. And, and again, it's not just me. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not the one that just does it by myself. I have all these wonderful staff members and all this entire team that knows what they're supposed to do on a daily basis. And this huge institution that allows me to provide this support to these people, right? I have all this stuff at my disposal. I provide them with the environment and the medications that by science we know can help them. And then like, they'll say, Thank you for saving my life. Mm. I'll get like these text messages around Christmas. And I, I I can spend Thanksgiving or Christmas with with my wife and grandchildren because of you. Like it's a little too much sometimes when I really think about it, but that's what that's why I do it. And like the discharge parade that we had for the guy, I was like, Lowers thousand point. I was like, this is this is how we should do it all the time, man. Mm. This is great. Every this time a patient it, leaves, let's have the last celebration. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, dude. I don't know if you can share one specific story that that sticks out, but um, what what I want to do is the leadership topic of the day is how to lead during crisis, right? So, what did you learn about your own leadership and the leadership of your team that we could take away like a nugget uh, from? leading when nobody knew what was going on. There was nobody who lived through this, right? Did leaders, did certain leaders step up maybe that were unexpected? Was it, you know, everybody leading together? Was there one person that took control? Tell us a little bit about that. I, up until this had happened, I had mentor, very good mentors, like I discussed at the beginning, that would push me and would be like, Evan can do that. And they would kind of lead me to the, you know, to the front. So I was, and I was already starting to publish some things and be speaking at different conferences. And so I, I was pushed into it by association. I think you, you, you mentioned it to Chad um, in an earlier podcast that you were the leader by association, right? Yep. By association, I was in this role doing things that I wanted to provide better care for my patients. So I was publishing and writing and connecting with people. And I just kind of slowly ramped up. And it was like this perfect storm where this major health crisis came. And I just was like, okay, uh, well, what does everyone think? And I was like, well, this is what I think we should do. And I had these administrators that had trusted me to build the program. And when COVID hit. I'll never forget. We had a meeting. It was like, there was no patients in the hospital, nothing. You know, we weren't shut down. Nothing. Everyone thing was normal. Right. And we had this meeting and, and it was like that the wave was coming from like the New York city, right? New York city had cases and was starting to like shut down. It was weird. And like Washington state and like California. So it was like on the East and West coast. And we had this big meeting and administrators, I put together this like structure and I was like, well, this is how many ICU beds have. This is how many pumps we have. This is how much staff we have. And then we had in the meeting, they were like, Evan, what, what do we do if the sky's falling, the, the hospital's on fire, there's people outside? Like, what do we do? And I was like, this is what we do right here. This is, what, this is the list. Not knowing that, that they were like, they would go, okay, do it. And the next day, the next day, we had this meeting at 4 p.m., on a Tuesday, the next day at 6 a.m. on a Wednesday, uh, hey, we have this patient, we need you to come get, you know, up in one of our guys saying your hospitals up in Scranton, you need ECMO and um, you need to come get them. And we were like, okay, let's go. I called my staff members, my staff, and I was like, this is what we're gonna do. We had a meeting yesterday at four o'clock, X, Y, Z. We're going to do this. This is how our shifts are going to run. This is we're going to have the pump set up. This is how we're going to streamline our equipment. 
um, this is the step-by-step -step process. And they were like, okay, whatever, all right, whatever you say, let's do it. I'm, I'm, if that's what you say, let's do it together. We're good. We're good. Let's go. And so I just kind of kept, kept going with it. Right. I just kept kind of rolling with it as, as people would come to me and ask me for things. I just, by association, I would just be like, all right, well, let's just do this. How are we better prepared for future crises now? We have a playbook for it now. Now there's a playbook. So that's the positive is we're much more prepared. And then I have one last question, Evan, and it's, um, as leaders in our communities, how do we inspire the next Evan Gajkowski? How do we inspire folks to realize that there's a need, service above self, whatever you want to call it, um, to kind of get into medicine and uh, get that feeling that they're making a major difference? Listen, man, I look at you, honestly. I look at Chad Lysenring. I look at Chad Lauer. I look at just my friend, Mark Waitovich. I look at my friends that I went to high school with and they're leaders, right? You came back after you were away for so long because you wanted to do better for your area. I wanted to give better care to the people around me because I, that, I, I knew how to do nursing. I knew how to do this new uh, ECMO stuff. And now I'm a nurse practitioner in cardiology. So I, I see general cardiology patients. So I see patients in my community that have heart failure that I want to take care of. And you're a prime example. Chad Lysenring is a prime example. What he's trying to do in Shemokin. That, that blows my mind. I have nothing compared to what you guys are doing on every day. Doing things like this, starting a marketing company, coming back to Elysburg, Pennsylvania to make it a better place. I look to you guys. How can I do that better? Well, I go back to high school. We all met in high school. We were all doing it. So every year I go to the high school. I take pig hearts. I take different cardiology stuff. I have a little heart over here. I take that stuff in and I give presentations to the kids to influence them into doing that. I coach wrestling elementary. Now I, I used to coach uh, high school wrestling and try to be a positive in the community for that. If somebody needed to be a soccer coach, go be a soccer coach, right? If you have time, go do these things. You're, you're a basketball coach. Who would ever thought you'd come back and be a elementary SYBL basketball coach. And, and those are th th those little things add up over time. If we're going to take a nugget from this podcast, it's that. And here's why. That's what community is. Those kids are watching us. They're literally watching somebody. And and, and here's, the, you guys know my thing is I, I think we need to be a little tougher on kids, right? I, I do. Sure. And, and, and those kids are watching. So, so let's just use us for an example, right? So they're watching knowing now that I've told my story. Man, this guy, I'll be honest, my, I already know, March 11th. March 11th is my next MRI. How do I live knowing that that's coming down the road. How do I respond? I, I keep showing up. I'm there at practice with you. Yeah. Right? I, I'm doing it. How do you live? You're like, okay, you might've just put somebody in the morgue, but you're showing up to wrestle. You're yeah. literally showing up to wrestle. So the, that's teaching these kids that life's going to be stinking tough, right? It's going to, it's going to get rough. Right. Yeah. And, and, and how do you respond? And they watch it. So I agree, Evan, thanks for that nugget. I mean, the reality is, we do what we do. We do it humbly with passion. And that's another thing. You can't, you have to be humble about it, right? You can't, you can stick your neck out and, and, and every once in a while, throw a little lift happy your, for lift me. your leg, right? Maybe right. lift your right. leg. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> but you got to keep, you can't just keep relying on that, you know, that situation and you just keep using it. Like, I, I don't want my light. I don't, a lot of focus has been on me and the ECMO program. I've get, I, I'm at the point where I've given it to another individual. I'm in charge of him and still the team, but I, I want to keep going. Like I, 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 I want to, I yeah. I want to keep going. Yeah. And I, and you can't, you can't like sit back and be like, all right, here we go. I'm done. Yeah. Done. My yeah. career's done. I did my thing. Yeah. You can't. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got it. You got it. You got to go back up the hill. Yeah. You got to go up the hill twice. Right. Yeah. You got to keep going. And you have to use those days where you left that hospital 
not knowing if you were going to contract a disease, not, not being able to see your wife or see your kids or hug them. You had to run up that stinking hill and come back. So now today when you don't have to do that, you use that as a freaking memory to say yeah. like, how grateful am I that we're past that? How grateful am I that we got through that? And I'm not stopping now, right? I'm not looking back and saying like, oh, woe is me. I went through that. Or woe is me. That, that, that tractor trailer was overflowing of bodies. <clears throat> You're saying, no, now I'm going to be thankful that I'm here. I made it. And what can I do to help the next patient? What's the next disease I can learn about? What's the next science I can learn about, right? That's yeah. what keeps us yeah. going as a society. Sorry, I'm getting fired up. You guys can see I, I wear my emotions oh. on my sleeve. But like, if we're going to learn one thing from this, from Evan Gikowski, it's listen, we're going to keep going. We're going to stack the days. We're going to keep learning. We're going to be a lifelong learner. And kids are watching us, right? They're right. watching what we do. You have to lead by example. Yeah. Dude, I love it, man. Um, honestly, that's all we have for the day. I truly appreciate you coming on and telling those stories. But seriously, thank you for it. I know it has to be hard to kind of relive that. And I know it has to be hard to kind of talk about it. But we appreciate you. The community appreciates you. And again, let's learn from it. And let's use it to motivate us to do the next thing. Sound good? Yeah, man. I appreciate you guys very much. All right, Chad, what an awesome guest we had in Evan Gajkowski. What are your thoughts? I've known Evan and his whole family for a long, long time. Wonderful people. And uh, I honestly, I never knew all of the things that he went through during that time period of the initial phase of COVID coming in. I, I really had no idea. So I was just literally hanging on the edge of my seat, <laughs> listening to his story about his daily involvement. It's, yeah. it's, it was pretty crazy. Those of us that aren't in medicine, I think it's really hard to relate, but you don't realize how much people were sacrificing. And when he tells the story about the tractor trailer outside sure. of the hospital full of bodies that he had to drive by every day and how he would go to those hills to just run and try to get the mental toll of what he was dealing with on a day-to-day kind of out of his brain so he could go be a dad and a husband you know while some of us were there you know just kind of not taking this seriously it, it, it's really something and I think we're, we're far enough removed from the emotions of the situation that I think we can look back now with rational thought all of us taking the political political views out and say, man, thank you. That's all I'm saying here. I'm not telling you what to believe, but I think we can all put ourselves in other people's shoes and say to that nurse or that hospital worker that, you know, cause we all know them who were in the battle. Thank you. And that's what this podcast is about. I just leave this podcast feeling so thankful and motivated to, you know, just again, be a positive force in our communities. Leadership topic of the day. Today is leading in crisis. And I think this is important for all of us. I kind of asked Evan about what happens in those situations in medical. And, and I have a few tips that I come And they're not my tips. These are tips that I've aggregated from Harvard, Harvard Business Review, different journals, et cetera. So I've, ag your research. Yeah, I've aggregated my favorite tips and they are as follows, right? When we're in crisis... The number one thing we need to do is seek credible information. And in 2024, it's extremely hard to do. That's not Bobby's basement blog and the guy on Instagram. That's not credible. Okay. So the first thing we can do is seek credible information. Number two, use appropriate communication channels. So what I, what I mean by that is if we're an organization or we're a family or whatever, how can we communicate to diminish fear, reduce stress, et cetera? That means we're going to have a leader who's giving us those credible information sources that we're going to rely on. We're not listening to every Bobby, Sue, Joe, and Harry. Who's the expert? And we're going to listen to them. Explain your plan to each other of what we're doing during the crisis. So have a plan. Okay. So we're going to communicate that plan. We're going to execute that plan. That's number three. Be present. Don't just tap out and then come back and be like, what'd you all figure out? Yeah. Show up. Yeah, those people are the ones that drive me nuts, right? They'll come back with some expertise that they read in two seconds and think that they're an expert. No, like be present, yep. sift through the information, be available to help. Number five, and this is a big one, document. Document it so we know what steps we took. So if there's another crisis that's the same way, we can do it better next time. Those to me are, are, are just five basic things that we can do. 
if we're going to step up in, in, in crisis and, and I know this podcast is kind of long, but I, I want to talk to you guys about somebody named Jake Wood. Jake Wood started team Rubicon. He was a client at Lauer media. He has a book, um, and team Rubicon, he was, a, I think America's top sniper in the military at one point. He's a scary dude. Whoa. You all can check him out. All right. You got my attention. So he started team Rubicon and team Rubicon literally just runs to disasters and crisis. They're all former military folks. He found that these former military folks that come back, they need to do something and they need to feel a part of something. So they run to Haiti when there's a hurricane and they just start giving medical care. They don't ask anybody for permission. They just show up who's going right. And I think, you know, we can learn so much from that. And I think these, these tips for leading during crisis, we can use in the business world. Listen, today we talked about medicine. It's a little more serious, but I think we can learn from medicine. We can learn from military and apply it to the business world as well. So there's going to be crisis in business, right? People are going to quit on the job. You know, there's going to be something negative that happens in your business. Use these tips to lead during crisis and you'll get through it. You will get through it. That's all I have for the day today, Chad. Anything Is that to add? it? That's it. Anything Are to add? Are you sure? I'm positive, brother. No, it was a great episode. I'm always happy to be a part of it, pal. All right, man. Listen, I can't wait to get started on the next one. Are you a business owner, a leader, or an aspiring achiever looking to turn life's challenges into powerful fuel for your success? You've come to the right place. Get ready to unlock the secrets to turning life's hardships into your most powerful ally. Your hosts, along with our incredible guests, will help you tap into your own Lauer power and guide you towards the success you've always dreamed of. 